They say that one learns something new every day. And though I've not yet learned who they are, I rather suspect that they are indeed correct. Just last week, I was up north visiting some friends who were spending a few days in the lakes. I was making my way to meet them at a bus stop when I happened upon a newsagent and tobacconist. So I popped inside uh, to purchase some Kendall mint cake, as one does when in the district, you know, a prerequisite for any ascent of Mount Everest, of course. And, um, and I found myself engaged in a most fascinating conversation. It's not that we were considering any such uh, mountainous climb that day, you understand. Uh, indeed, our initial plans of ascending cat bells had already been scuppered due to the threat of inclement weather and uh, replaced with plans to visit Honister along with a, a descent of the world-famous slate mine. Well, the conversation which ensued had nothing whatsoever to do with either mountains or mines, but was rather to do with the price of maggots. Uh, did I mention that this tobacconist was also a purveyor of fishing tackle and bait supplies. Well, they were. And the chap behind the counter was commenting on yet another increase in the price of maggots. Apparently, two weeks previously, they had been £12.50 per gallon. Now, they were £14.50, having just that day gone up another 50 pence per gallon. That's 10 shillings in proper money. And you're probably wondering what on earth had brought about such an outrageous increase in the cost of these maggots. Well, apparently the reason had to do with their need for heat in order to, to breed, and then the, uh, the ongoing increase in fuel costs. So, there we are. I had learned something new. I never knew that maggots were sold by the gallon. Now, you're probably also wondering, what does anything have to do with the, uh, the price of maggots? And that would be a jolly good question. Personally, I've never been tempted to eat maggots, and quite the opposite. I mean, the sight of a gallon of squirming maggots would very soon put me off eating even the most tasty of morsels. But if I was a fish, ah, that would be something altogether different. Towards the end of the collection of documents we know as the New Testament, there are a number of letters written by a variety of individuals, one of whom we know as James, the brother of Jesus. Well, actually, one of the half-brothers of Jesus. He had not only become a follower of Jesus, but he had also become a prominent leader among the people of God. And he's writing a letter to believers whose faith was beginning to lose much of its substance. Well, at the beginning of the letter, he writes of the need to be steadfast, to remain true to the ways of God, and, 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 and that is particularly important. Whenever we face all kinds of trials or temptations, he says, whatever you do, 
Don't even think about blaming God when you're tempted to do things which you know you jolly well ought not to do. God isn't like that. He doesn't do things like that. But rather, he goes on to say, when we are tempted. It's because we are being lured and enticed by our own desires. And then he says that the desire, when it has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters, he warns us. Well, one thing is for sure. James doesn't mince his words. He, he's not inclined to, to beat around the bush, as it were. But he means what he says, and he says what he means. If we begin to dabble with our desires, with our desires for things we know are not good for us, then sooner or later we're going to put them into practice. And then, when we've become more than accustomed to putting into practice the things we desired that were not good for us, well, before long, they'll be the death of us. It's, if you like, it's a, it's a natural progression. There's, there's no getting away from it. To dabble with unhealthy desires is to dabble with death. So don't do it. Yes. Well, as he does throughout his uh, letter, uh, James uses some particularly graphic language to describe this process of desire leading to disobedience, which ultimately gives birth to death. It's a process that is rooted in deception, and it all begins with that gallon of maggots. He said that when we are tempted, we're being lured and enticed by our own desires. Now, think about that for a moment, yeah? And think about fishing. I understand very well that you and I may not find a gallon of maggots to be particularly appetizing, but then you and I are not fish. Were we to be fish, well, that would be, uh, you know, a, a, an altogether different matter. Were we to be fish, then the sight of maggots on the menu, well, that would be a, a real joy, eh? My newsagent and tobacconist, come purveyor of fishing tackle and bait supplies, he knew very well that though I may have a preference for mint cake over maggots, that fish do not. The moment the fish sees one of these wriggling maggots dangled before them in the water, their first thought is that it must be time for luncheon. And before one can say something like, uh, I wouldn't do that if I was you, uh, well, the fish has gobbled the maggot and found itself ensnared by the cleverly disguised hook, lured and enticed by its desire for a maggot. Ha, what a way to go! Now, if only our friend, the, the fish, 
uh, friend, that is. If only he had known that the delectable maggot was, in fact, concealing a deathly hook. If only he had known that, well, he would have thought twice before taking a nibble. But he knew nothing of it. And by the time he realises just what is going on, well, it's too late. He's been caught. Hook, line and sinker too, perhaps. The secret of, caching, of catching fish is the, 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 the art of deception. I mean, try dangling an unconcealed hook in the lake and the fish won't be deceived. They won't be remotely interested. But the maggot, oh, that delicious maggot is simply too good to let go by. Hmm. One of the most illustrative examples that I've seen of this principle, uh, call it the, the maggot principle if you like, one of the most illustrative examples I've seen of this is in a scene from one of my favourite films. And a number of years ago, I had the opportunity of visiting the spot where this particular scene was shot. You may have seen the film, named after its central automotive character, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. <clears throat> and if you haven't seen it, then you jolly well ought to, even if only for this particular scene. Ah, what a delight. So, very slight spoiler alert here. Hmm? Without giving too much away, there is in this film a rather nasty chap in this foreign land whose job it is to catch children on behalf of the wicked baron who wants to lock them up out of the way. This chap is rather creatively known as the child catcher, huh? and he's been the subject of many children's nightmares over the decades. I'm quite sure of that. Well, to cut a rather fascinating story inexcusably short, there are two children being kept hidden in a, a toy shop. Now, as to why there is a, a toy shop in a land where children are forbidden, well, uh, you'll need to watch the film, won't you? But the child catcher skips into the town square with a rather cleverly disguised horse-drawn wagon, luring and enticing the children with lollipops cherry pie, cream puffs, ice cream and treacle tart, all free today. Well, needless to say, they fall for it. Huh? The children fall for the evil ruse and before you can say all free today, one more time they are trapped and taken away, much to the dismay of the on-watching townsfolk. But, as I was saying, if you haven't yet seen this classic film, then you really ought to, even if only for this scene. It's a very powerful portrayal of the principle of luring and enticing and then of capture and entrapment. It's also rather scary, so be warned. But you know, it makes no difference whether it be maggots or ice cream and lollipops. To those who desire such things, the appeal can be almost overwhelming. In both instances, what was on offer seemed too good to let go by. But they were deceived. 
I mean, if only the fish had known what the maggot was hiding. Yeah? Uh, if only the children had known that cherry pie and ice cream were nowhere to be seen. They were just empty promises. If only they had known the truth, then they wouldn't have been so enamoured with what was on offer. I'm not so sure that I would be so easily lured and enticed by cherry pie and treacle tart, and I'm quite sure that a wriggling maggot would have absolutely no appeal to me whatsoever. But each of us does have our own desire, as James explains in this part of his letter, our own desire for things we are better off without. And for each one of us, it is different. You know, the things that you find so attractive may be of absolutely no interest to me whatsoever. And likewise, the things which I find desirable may do absolutely nothing for you. But such is the nature of our desires. They can be terribly personal individual, if you like. And such is the power of our desires that all too often we become blinded to the truth and we allow ourselves to be deceived, you know, just in case whatever is forbidden might yet still have something to offer. I mean, haven't we all been there? Do we not all have things that are at least a part of us once, but in the full light of day, we really want nothing to do with whatsoever? On one occasion, Jesus said that if you obey my teaching, you are really my disciples. You will know the truth and the truth will set you you free. It seems to me that the addictive power of our desire lies in its deception. The thing is that as long as we think that our wrongdoing, as long as we think that sin might yet have something to offer, we will continue to be fooled will continue to be lured and enticed by its deception. We need to open our eyes and see our desires for what they really are, and only then can the truth really set us free. The price of maggots may have gone up in the shops, but the fish will still pay with its life. That's the real cost. And it's time that we recognised the true cost of those things which we might yet still desire, but which, if allowed to take hold, will take us away from God and cost us more dearly than we could ever imagine. I don't only think, but I know that this is such a difficult lesson to learn. And yet I hear it time and time again, one way or another, in the teachings of Jesus. Do you remember when he said that if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Hmm? You know, to deny ourselves is to say no to ourselves, to deny the desires that 
keep us from devoting ourselves to God. We're to store treasures in heaven, Jesus would teach us, not on this earth. In living for Jesus, we no longer live for ourselves. We no longer live for our lives here on earth. What we want for this life is no longer our prime concern. We're no longer our own. We we no longer belong to ourselves. We belong to God. And this was always the way of Jesus. It was the way he lived among us. And it's the way of life, the way of truth that brings to light the, the falsehood and deception of this world. When we can see the truth of our own desires, whatever they might be, when we can see the concealed hook, as it were, only then can we begin to break free of their hold. Well, I hope that this might be for us something to think about. May our loving, merciful Father in heaven truly bless us with an ever-growing knowledge and understanding of the truth. May he open our eyes to see the deceitfulness of our own desires, that we might no longer want the things that we seem to want. May he give us hearts that want to desire only the things of heaven. And yes, may God bless us abundantly so that we might truly be a blessing to those around us. Thank you for listening.